When I said that I had 17 days until I leave for costume college, I meant that I had 17 days until I need to get on a plane to California, which means that both this dress as well as the video for said dress needed to be done before then. Really, I had like 11 days to make this dress, so here we are making the dress in exactly these 11 days. And for those of you who missed the announcement video or like the title of this video, this is to be a rather fantastical, loosely 1840s inspired interpretation of Edgar Allan Poe's mass of the Red Death. I'm not wholly certain exactly what I'm doing with this dress. There is admittedly going to be a lot of making it up as I go along here. So I'm just starting out with the bit I'm presently most certain on, and that is the skirt. This, since the fabric is a super wide 120 inches in width, is getting folded in half lengthwise with the folded edge at the hem of the dress, which also means no hemming. I'm just pinning the selvage edges together and running a quick basting stitch along that edge to hold them firmly together. So I am presently trying to decide between gathers for the skirt or pleats for the skirt. The gathers, of course, will probably make it puff out a little bit more. However, as you can see, the pleats will provide a little bit more density to the top area of the skirt. Whereas this is just completely sheer pretty much all the way around, but it's so nice and puffy. So I had initially planned to do pleats. Um, but then decided that maybe gathers might be fun. Well, here's the thing is I can always probably wear a skirt support underneath this if I want it to truly be very puffy. I can't necessarily always get the opaqueness once it's not there. So maybe I will go ahead and just pin the pleats onto the mannequin just to sort of get a sense of that and drape the bodice over top of the skirt so that I can get a full sense of what the actual dress looks like. Okay, cool. Let's do that. With the skirt roughly in a decent pleating arrangement, I then proceeded to drape the bodice. I'm doing this while vaguely referencing the shape of an 1840s bodice pattern in Janet Arnold, which means putting in two darts at the front and cutting the center front ever so slightly on the bias. I am entirely unsure of how this is going to work out, but we are going to give this a go. I've also pleated up a sample strip for that Bertha collar strap thing, which I'm just using to mark the position of where I want the neckline to end. Then all of my lines are marked with pencil before removing the muslin from the stand. The all important center front and side seam lines, the darts, waistline, and the position of the top edge. Then I did the same draping thing for the back, but ignore where I'm putting that seam line because that is very not correct, as we shall soon discover. Okay, so I have fit the mock-up. I stupidly did not pick up the camera whilst I did so, but I just made a couple of small changes. I just have to change the height of the darts on the center front, as well as move this back seam because this back seam right now is under my arm, which is not correct. It should be actually on my back. I also had to take out a lot of room down the center back. All of this back stuff is kind of conjecture because as we know, we can't exactly bend like that. So I'm just doing some experimenting here. I will go and try this on again once I do these few alterations and see if this makes any difference and if we can proceed. The second mock-up did, in fact, turn out to be slightly more agreeable. So I then proceeded to transfer the adjusted mock-up shapes onto some clean pattern paper. To mentally prepare myself for the impending but entirely self-inflicted battle with cutting out organza, I decided to take a cleansing moment to accomplish the mindless task of stitching down the skirt pleats real quick. Then, organza. So the remnant fabric that I had initially had two of these large appendages coming off either end. This is only one half of the width. As you can see, it is quite wide. Somebody had this yardage of fabric before I did and gave it to me because they didn't know what to do with it. Somebody before me apparently had cut out a giant thing right out of the middle of the yardage very poorly which is super wise. This is where I chopped it off the end of the existing yardage. So I do have two of these very uneven bits that I had to cut off because I couldn't put this into the skirt, which means I can cut the bodice out of this. So I have two of this, these rough shapes here. So I think what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to cut four of each bodice piece. I think I have enough to do that. That way I can double layer them and get a little bit more of an opaque red. We have made the most clever decision to make the bodice out of this Organza, if you have worked with a sheer material before, such as an organza, you will know, is 
the absolute worst thing you could ever wish upon yourself. It just doesn't really hold a shape ever. Since I don't have one of those fancy homo pinboard cutting tables, I'm just going to sort of try and control the edges as much as I can by just taping them down, just to sort of keep everything roughly into some sort of on-grain grid shape whilst I cut things out, and we shall see where we can go from there. I decided to do this thing where I'm cutting one layer of the bodice on the straight grain and one on the cross grain. I don't know if this applies to organza, but I do know this is a technique used in some mid 20th century couture foundation garments for strengthening purposes. So I decided to give this a try with this, but also because I know there will be a subtle color difference between each direction, so I'll get to play around and see which turns out to be the best color. Once all my pieces are marked out, we can cease all of this madness and get the pieces cut out. And since organza is such a loosely woven material and thus chalk marks want to evaporate immediately, I then thread marked all around the edges. Okay, we are all cut out. I've got two of each bodice piece and then I've got two long strips for the Bertha collar. As you can see, I've got literally, I only had just enough fabric. It's literally just scraps, just strips of cabbage left over coleslaw, I suppose, if you will. I did have just enough to do two layers of each bodice piece, which means I can overlay them. So I've done a little experiment here and then I've laid the different grain panels on top just to see the color difference because this is a shot organza, which means I think the warp is red and the weft is black. So this one one is cut straight grain with the red threads going vertically, this one is cut on the cross grain with the black threads going vertically, and as you can see there's a subtle difference in color, this one's a little bit brighter, more vibrant, and this one's a bit duller, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put the straight grain panel on the top just so that I get maximum vibrancy from this. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is I'm going to go ahead and just lay one on top of the other, I'm going to go ahead and do it straight grain wise, so I'll redo this one, and then I'm going to pad stitch these layers together just to hold them really really super firm because as you may or may not have noticed organza is very slippery it doesn't like to stay in one place on one grain at all so this will just be my vague effort to try and tame it a little bit i think i will probably have to stabilize it with something all of the lining and structure layers are still to be determined but for now pad stitching are you so over watching me pad stitch things by now i keep forgetting that there isn't just one same person watching these videos consecutively and that maybe you didn't sit through nine collective minutes of pad stitching footage all through lady sherlock please enjoy some pad stitching which in this case is the temporary basting stitch i'm using to hold both these layers firmly together so that i can treat them as one piece of fabric without them rudely trying to behave as two separate entities okay so everything is cut out and pad stitched together at least the top layer is now i realize that i need some lining layers because because this is completely sheer and has absolutely no structure, so we need to fix that. So I have been experimenting and playing around with lining layers and strength layers and things to support this bodice. What I think I have tentatively come up with is that I think I will back this primary layer with some muslin, just because it is unassuming, it's untextured, you can't really see through it as soon as I press this out. I also thought about interlining the lining layer with some tarlatan because this is lovely and has some nice shape but also has really nice flexibility. I can just hear like actual fashion corset makers out there screaming about what I'm doing but I think this is going to serve my purposes decently. The only thing is if I interline the lining layer with some tarlatan this probably shouldn't be sitting next to my skin one because it's mega uncomfortable but also humans equals moisture which does not make tarlatan happy so what I think I will then do is go ahead and further interline the tarlatan and muslin layer with another layer of muslin to sit 
against the skin. Anyway, so I'm going to cut out further pieces out of this. That's a good plan. I'm going to do that. So all of my lining slash foundation pieces are now cut out. I have already started to pin together the innermost lining layer. I have also cut out the, the second lining layer, muslin layer, as well as some tarlatan, which is about to get pad stitched together, of course. And then these will get pinned together. I will also pin together these outer layers and we will start to actually put this thing together. I've pinned together my three layers now, the organza outer layer, the muslin and tarlatan middle layer, and the plain muslin lining, and also the center back seam of the skirt while I'm at it, which are all now stitched together most blasphemously using an electric sewing machine. All the seams of all the layers are then pressed. Now I'm going to add some boning channels to this middle stiffening layer in this black 3 8 of an inch twill tape so that they'll show through the organza and will be seen from the outside. These are pinned all along the seams, except for those two curved side back seams, and over both front darts as well. I'm now inserting some synthetic baleen bones into the channels, then going over them with a hot iron and lots of steam to mold them into shape. Then I could lay the organza layer over this foundation layer, pin everything smoothly into place, then baste all around the outer edges to keep everything secure. No. Here is where we are thus far. I know it kind of looks like garbage, but you know what? Embellishment is going to fix that. I am unsure yet as to how to proceed with this. Okay, so it still needs to be lined. It still needs to get this pleated collar bit, and it also still needs to get a lot of applique work. And I'm unsure as to which order in which I should do these things. I think it might be nice to actually be able to put this on and do this on myself, figure out where the collar should go, where the applique should go, because as you can see, it doesn't fit my dress form at all, which means that theoretically I would need to finish the bodice. I'd need to line it and put the closures in so that I could actually close it on me so that I could see it. I'm also kind of unsure whether or not I should take out the pad stitching. Part of me kind of likes it. Of course, I'd have to do something about these long tail edges, but I think it kind of gives it a really interesting like constructional texture. I also know for a fact that I've not got the bottom of the bodice in the right place yet, um, because as you can see, my waist is like here, this is a lot of extra room here. I know 1840s bodices tend to be a bit longer um, in the waist. I may just work on getting the waist in the right place, cut it where it needs to be, probably restitch this, and then get the lining in, get the closures in, and then we'll worry about the embellishments. That sounds like a logical plan of action. Oh my goodness, do you want to hear what a complete fool I am? Okay, so you know how I so cleverly decided to make this bodice a side closure so that I could very easily get into it? Yeah, well, I didn't do that for the skirt for some reason. The skirt is a center back closure. Oh, well, why don't you just move the closure to the side, you say? Well, because I decided to do that fancy thing where I put one big box pleat at the center front. So I can't just turn around the skirt so that the closure closes at the side because this has to be at center front. Either I have to take out all of the pleats and move the closure to the side, or I have to do some really cheeky rigging to get this to work. Or maybe have them separate to be determined. Oh my god, this is such a stupid mistake. Don't be like me, please. Apparently, I have a thing for making myself gala gowns that are long and red and that one cannot walk in. I've gone ahead and marked where I would like the waist to sit, as you can see right now. It's a little bit too low. I know a lot of like modern fantasy designers make their bodices down to like here and have the skirt coming out. That's not really my jam. Um, it's not historical, of course, at all, but I think it also just makes the silhouette look very modern and fantasy and not anything like anything vaguely resembling history. It will also be much more comfortable because right now I'm feeling a lot of pressure right here, which I don't like. I also have come to the realization that why am I going to bother making myself an underskirt for this dress when I could just wear a white slip? And I think this will function perfectly well, even though it's just a half slip and it's modern, but it does sort of vaguely resemble the chemises that they would wear under their dresses in 1840. So I'm really kind of about this life. I also have one in black. The black versus white debate continues. Anyway, here's the dress so far. She doesn't have the collar. She doesn't have any of the embellishments only pinned together at the side. So lots more work still needs to be done, but we're getting there. We are making some progress. It's happening. It is a thing. Okay, here we go. This is worlds better as you can hopefully see. 
um, the waist is <laughs> more in the right place. It looks more like a vaguely historical gown. So I'm going to go put a lining in this and then we shall get on to the embellishments. So first I just basted down the seam allowance all around the outer layer, then laid the lining layer over the inside, folded under that seam allowance, and pinned everything into place. This is then secured all around with a felling stitch. But wait! This is a modern fantasy project! Why didn't you just stitch it right sides together by machine and turn the whole thing out? Shh. Don't judge me, you will pry my historical lining methods from my cold, dead hands. In all seriousness though, turning out boned bodices is a form of torture I wouldn't wish upon mine enemy, so for the sake of my fragile peace of mind, I just did it by hand. And in other news, for a project that was supposed to be quick and machine stitched, I think it still ended up to be like 85% hand sewn. Fight me. The lining in place, I then marked the positions for some hooks and bars at the side seam closure at an inch and a half apart, and then stitched them down securely. And now for all of the decorative bits. Okay, so I am in process of putting the pleats into the Bertha collar. I have no clue what on earth possessed me to cut this on the pie. This is literally the worst thing I could have possibly ever dreamed to do to myself because as you can see, if you've ever had the misfortune of trying to make a fitted dress out of organza, and then you will be aware of what an absolute nightmare it is to work with on the straight grain. I literally hate every single thing on the face of the planet right now. Oh my god. If this comes out as a wearable shape, will be an absolute miracle. So I got one pleat halfway in before nearly succumbing to the uncontrollable urge to set the whole thing on fire, so I decided to try pleating it up on the dress form, and this indeed proved a much more civil process. So I have gone ahead and I have pinned on these shoulder strap bits where I think they should sit. I think I may have to play around with somehow stabilizing these pleats because once these pins come out they don't really want to stay like that. Part of me doesn't want to go in and hand stitch down every single pleat. I may end up doing that. We shall see. I have not put a closure into this. There is a side closure obviously in the bodice but I think I will be able to get it on and off just by slipping through this off the shoulder, very wide neckline and then doing it up from the side. I think that should be okay. So my next step is to stitch this down, figure out what this pleat situation is. Oh, and I may go ahead and put on the applique bit. I haven't decided if I'm going to have the applique sort of underlay this collar or go over the collar. I'm not sure. I may underlay it. So I got over my denial and proceeded to tack each pleat into place with a running stitch. And now I can stitch the two halves together, then pin the collar bit onto the bodice to check the placement, which was perhaps redundant since I ended up removing it in favor of putting on the applique first. The beaded applique is cut from this beaded yardage that I picked up in the garment district back in the previous design vlog, and I've just cut out two of these V-shapes for the front and back bodice edge, as well as two for the waist edges. I'm then just going in with a small scissor and cutting away the net closely around the edges. The applique is pinned into place, then stitched all around the outer edges. I'm leaving a few of the bigger leaves at the top unstitched so that these can overlap the Bertha collar. Then, of course, the Bertha collar can be attached to the bodice, which I'm just doing with a quick running back stitch. And those stray applique pieces are now tacked down over top. And now to attach the skirt. As you can see, I decided to just rig it instead of repleating the whole thing. I've just lined up the center front points, then pinned down as far as I could all around. The excess bit will just extend past the bodice and will close separately before the bodice is closed. This is done once again with a hook on the extended edge and a bar on the bodice edge so that the skirt can close up nicely underneath the bodice. It all worked out not to worry. 
And with the dress in one piece now, I can go ahead and get the other set of applique pieces on at the waist. And whilst I stitch these on, it is now time that I tell you a bit about our sponsor for this project, Audible, who have most kindly justified my impulsive purchase of all of this beading in the first place. So please enjoy this hashtag aesthetic montage of stitching lots of shiny things whilst, of course, I propound the wonders of audiobooks. If you know me at all, you know my propensity for consuming vast quantities of literature, and one way I am able to do so is through said audiobooks, which make excellent company for long hand stitching afternoons. Audible has countless titles available for listening, including pretty much every popular new release and classic, so much historical fiction, as well as some of my more obscure non-fictional favorites. All of the Ruth Goodman, Ian Mortimer's Time Traveler's Guides, and enough Bill Bryson to keep you laughing for days. They also have hundreds of original titles exclusive to Audible, written or narrated by some familiar names, including one title narrated by Stephen Fry entitled Victorian Secrets, and which is, for obvious reasons, next on my listening list. And whilst we are on the topic of listening recommendations, Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death also just so happens to be available for listening on Audible. It's a super quick quarter of an hour listen, and you can listen to it for free with a 30-day trial, or members get a free audiobook each month along with exclusive discounts and such. So if you're watching this video and still have no idea who exactly this Red Death is, well, I don't think anyone does really, but at least you can speculate along with the rest of us. There's a particularly special offer that ends on the 31st of July in our year 2019, where Amazon Prime members get Audible for four. $4.95 a month for the first three months, which is basically like getting three months for the price of one. After that is only $14.95 a month. You can take advantage of this by going to audible.com slash Bernadette or texting Bernadette to 500-500. Once again, that is audible.com slash Bernadette or Bernadette to 500-500 via text. And with that, the applique and the dress is now complete. Dare I say this isn't couture, but it is a thing and it happened. And now I have something to wear for the red carpet on Saturday. Oh, well, incidentally, the day that this video goes up is the day that I shall be wearing this on said red carpet, which is most perfect timing or most poor timing as you won't get to see footage of that in this video. And thus this hasty attempt at trying to capture a full body shot in a wee Manhattan apartment shall have to suffice for now. More footage to come in next week's costume college vlog if that that is of interest. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revellers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay, and the Red Death held illimitable dominion over all.